All right, so it is 2.32, so we will go ahead and kick things off. And just a reminder uh, to both you and the audience members, this is being recorded. Um, so this is the final session of our um, afternoon of workforce solutions for most vulnerable populations. I do want to point out that um, today we are covering minorities and youth uh, populations, but in the future, we are also planning a webinar to specifically talk about women and um, individuals with disabilities. So, and disabilities can mean anything from a physical disability to uh, mental health issue. So, um, just want to point that out. We understand that there are far more uh, populations that have been uh, extraordinarily impacted by the pandemic than just the two that we're discussing today. Um, initially, we had tried to put all of them in one afternoon, but realized that the content was far too robust and in depth in order to uh, to do that. So, um, anyway. So we uh, today are, are going to close things out um, with the next hour or so talking about youth specific programs for workforce solutions. And so I have with me today Vince Bertram, Kenneth Hardy, who goes by Kenny. Is it okay if the audience calls you Kenny? Okay. 100%. All right. And then um, Dennis Parker. So um, all kind of experts in the industry, very, very different backgrounds. So that's why I was hoping that you could give um, just a little bit of a brief overview about your company. So Dennis, we'll start with you. We'll go to Kevin and then we'll finish up with Vince. So Dennis, if you'd like to just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and what your organization's about. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, greetings to the virtual world out there that I can see from my end. My name is Dennis Daho Parker. I work for Toyota Motor North America. Those, that's our North American headquarters for uh, Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And very specifically, I work in education and talent development. Uh, in that role with Toyota, uh, we developed a program that is known as FAME and the FAME Career Pathway. FAME is Federation for Advanced Manufacturing Education. It essentially uh, offers a career pathway that stretches from pre-K do master's degree, but the hub program is a two-year technician program. Many of you may be aware that uh, if you're an employer of technical talent, I come from manufacturing, it's all about technical talent, but it goes beyond us, right? Uh, you have a lot of workforce problems on that. Not enough technicians to fill the available jobs. We don't feel like the ones who are coming through are work ready. Uh, with that and we also have a disproportionate number of our technical workforce who is older when they retire even bigger problems right well in a nutshell fame addresses it through its pipeline continuous flow process uh it address the program has found success beyond toyota it is being transitioned to uh the manufacturing institute who is the workforce partner with the national association of manufacturers because they would like to scale up across the US. And I am currently in an extended assignment from Toyota to the Manufacturing Institute to assist that transition. I am the Director of Experiential Learning at White Residential and Family Services. I work with about 100 youth that are placed with the court um, for residential treatment, anywhere from uh, behavior issues to drug addiction, um, and so my job is to get these kids ready for entry into the workforce. Um, we find a lot of uh, youth come into our programs with very little experience um, through their families, through their extended families, communities with um, long-term work experience. So they come very deficient in a lot of the soft skills that people talk about every day. So my job is to hopefully even that playing field a little bit for them. So when they are ready to reintegrate back into their communities, that they are able to go out and find that first entry level job and to be successful and then maintain that. Yes, great. Thanks, Andrea. And you know, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with each of you. My name is Vince Birch. I'm president and CEO of Project Lead the Way. So. PLTW is an organization that creates a curriculum for K-12 schools across the United States in engineering, biomedical science, and computer science. And we train thousands of teachers every year on how to teach in a project-based classroom. But the real focus of our work is how do we inspire our nation's children to think about their career pathways, career opportunities, and help them develop the skills to pursue those pathways. And and too often in education, we have found that 
you know, one, students don't and won't be what they can't see. They have to aspire to something. That's why we have so many children in sports programs. They they see they see that and they have role models. And we need to provide them role models across multiple industries uh, across our economy. So we focus a lot on career learning, but it, we have discovered that it, it's not the traditional pathway that's going to inspire students to pursue STEM in general or manufacturing, that it's really around a set of skills that students have to develop and confidence that they can pursue these pathways. So we focus on problem solving, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, ethical reasoning, and then bringing that with, with career learning, we set students on pathways to enduring careers. And we currently operate in over 12,000 schools nationwide in all 50 states. We have millions of students participating in our program. And finally, we really try to make strong connections with great industry partners. You know, Dennis mentioned Toyota's work and what Dennis's vision for what's happened in fame. It was his, it was his thinking and his vision that helped create that. But we were proud to partner on the very beginning of this and helping grow that type of program. And you know, so thinking about how we partner with small manufacturing companies to large multinationals around the talent pipeline. And that's where we are, that's the intersection where we really spend all of our time thinking about how we make a difference for America's children. So again, you know, very diverse backgrounds, very diverse missions, um, but all kind of holistically making an impact on our youth nationwide. So I'm really excited to kind of dig into some of the questions that I know that we discussed that we're going to go over. Um, you will notice from time to time that I'm looking down. It's usually because I'm writing down some of your one-liners. Um, you all have some amazing insight. And so we want to make sure that we get that information back out to folks uh, after the webinar is over. So we're going to keep the, the video and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. Um, but beyond that, we really want to make sure that people have some, some takeaways here. Because if they're anything like me, whenever I attend one of these events, I'm like, oh, man, I wish I would have gotten that written down. So we've got a team of folks hoping that we can do that. Um, Vince, specifically, um, I feel like I could get this on a T-shirt. Um, kids will not be what they cannot see. I think that that's so important. Um, when we look at putting together plans and programs, you know, kids really have to be able to see that opportunity. So I think that's some really, really good insight there. Okay, so um, we're going to go around and um, I'll ask questions kind of in the same order as what we did for our introductions, just to keep things somewhat orderly. I may interrupt myself every now and then and interrupt our order just to kind of keep you guys on your toes. But for the most part, we'll stick with that. So um, so our very first question, Dennis, is going to be for you. Um, so we know that pre-existing workforce issues have really been exacerbated by the pandemic. So putting our young uh, people to work, 24 and younger, we know that that was a problem prior to the pandemic. But what has the pandemic shown us as an opportunity to move these things forward in a way that would not have occurred otherwise? Thank you very much. <laughs> So looking at that from the opportunity perspective, uh, Andrea, uh, I would probably think of this on maybe two or three different levels. So immediately, I believe, again, along with everyone else, the, the pandemic has been the, the great disruptor of our age that we've lived in ourselves, right? It's like nothing that we've seen uh, in our generation. Everything changed. And so the initial reaction, I think, might have been, uh, oh, my gosh, this, this is bad, right? And certainly from the aspect of the pandemic, it, it certainly is. However, it caused us, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what we did and kind of expand that to a, a wider thing. Uh, in order to effectively move forward through the, the, the pandemic, to keep our program in place, to keep uh, what was occurring at our partner colleges that we have going, and still achieve our outcomes because we did not want to give up our quality outcomes. You know, things are different. We'll just have to do it at a less lower level. That wasn't the answer for us. We had to think out new ways of communicating, new ways of engaging, ways that we could change, do different processes and achieve the same outcomes. 
uh, we had to reimagine how we would provide our training to the trainers and or to the leaders and providers, the chapter leaders and college leaders. And so we did that, right? Bringing many bright people together, thinking this out, and, and we did that. So at this first level I'm going to address, what we find out is this. We found effective ways to navigate through the pandemic. And now we realize, and we're not out of the pandemic yet, let's keep our fingers crossed that we can see it in the front windshield there, right? We find that many of the things that we did are going to carry forward for us beyond that. They're going to actually make us stronger. We're going to be more effective in what we did. We accelerated uh, many of the ways that we saw to improve. And so as we come out of the pandemic, uh, that's that's going to be a, a big help, right? Well, what are two places that that goes to, right? One, I think that everyone who is involved in this circle that we're talking about today. So how do we reach to, to challenged populations, right? Uh, with that, how do we communicate with them? On what works with them? I think the innovative thinking that the pandemic drove and many of the solutions that came out are going to assist us in making that outreach more effectively. And I think it's going to assist us in thinking of ways to have them, the, the students or the learners or the people who will come in to be employees, right? How can we make their journey more effective, lose less of them on the way, get more of them to the end where they have a great education that will be a sustaining tool to them throughout their life to maintain employment uh, with that. So I think that I think uh, those are maybe some of the most important values. We had we had things that are going to be temporary, right? I mean, we got financial assistance, you know, we got grants for workforce and colleges and so forth, but those will come to an end. But I think we learned so many innovative things in this outreach. That's what will carry us further. Your excellent points, Dennis. Thank you. All right, Kenny, I'm going to kick things over to you next. Same question, and I'll repeat it just briefly. Um, so pre-existing workforce issues have really exacerbated um, workforce issues that were there prior to the pandemic. What are the opportunities that you see impacting positive change in the workforce environment because of the pandemic? With the population I work with, um, we all know that the you know the entry level job that a lot of these kids were looking at, you know, it's fast food, it's you know introductory retail type of work. Um, yeah, that that came to an end. Um, you know, I'm talking, you know, to kids that, you know, they they were working prior to placement, you know, and April hit and everybody got laid off because Chick-fil-A closed or McDonald's cut back their hours. Um, and the story that I heard over and over again, not only from the kids that I work with, but from employers in the community, um, was that it, it really showed that a lot of our entry level kids were very pigeonholed into certain types of industries and that they were not resilient to something like the pandemic. Um, so I think the opportunity that comes from that is just the realization that we need to find as a community ways to not have our kids starting off their work experience with, do you want fries with that? We have to diversify that entry-level job for kids that may still be in high school. We have to think out of the box, and we've got some local community um, employers here where we're at that are very willing to work with us to think outside those boxes that I don't think really would have been prior to this. Um, so I think that the, the opportunity coming from, from this terrible pandemic that we're all living through still is that it's it's allowed the willpower to think outside the box to come to the forefront. Those are excellent points, Kenny. You know, the previous panel, um, the, the big kind of takeaway from that seemed to be um, that deliberate plans were really the answer for minority populations. Mm -hmm. I'm already starting to hear kind of a trend with you all that 
partnerships are really important. So I'm just wondering if that's going to be something that Vince is going to touch on just a little bit. So Vince, I'll go ahead and hand over that same question to you. What are your thoughts there? Of course I am. So, you know, I, yeah, I can address some of the partnership issues as well from our perspective. And, you know, but let me, let me start off. I think when I look at equity or the inequities that existed in our education system prior, I mean, they're real, and and I've always believed that our education system was one of the most inequitable things in in, in our society, right? And I and I can provide evidence of that. Just go into um, schools across the country, go to suburban, high income type of schools, and go to some of our most impoverished school districts, and just look at the inequities that exist. I mean, they're they're front and center. And every policymaker in this country knows it. They've seen it. They just haven't done anything about it. There's never been a sense of urgency around this. And then I, my concern around the pandemic has been, as yes, it has exacerbated these inequities. They've become front and center. We've seen students who don't have access to internet and broadband in their communities. They don't have personal devices. They have inadequate teachers in those situations who haven't been trained to deliver this kind of um, education at all. We've seen it, but let's go back to some other historical um, events in history. Oh, you one Hurricane Katrina was devastating to to the region, correct? And I mean, it was all over the news. We had people who were homeless, the the, you know, the poverty, the abject poverty there, and it just turned into a new cycle. A few days after Katrina, the news went away. We moved on to something else. And many of those problems still exist. And my concern is we can't let this opportunity pass us by, right? That we have to ensure that we address the equity issues in our education system. And I'm not suggesting at all that it's an easy solution. I'm not. I think it's going to be really hard. My question is, what have we learned from all of this and how do we move forward? And there are a few things, I think, from a student perspective. So I do believe, and again, not as a pessimist, just am I watching states and how they're directing education dollars and their funding formula? The reality is, I think we'll go back to normal in K-12 education. Right? I really do. I don't I don't think we're going to see these dramatic shifts in the market in K-12. I think 56 and a half million students are going to go right back to the way they received education before. But there's something that has happened for our students that we have to take advantage of. One, they've learned how to do this. Okay? Even if it's been a disaster in terms of being able to deliver all of our programs online, the reality is they have spent the last nine months learning virtually. And they know how to Zoom. They have the language down. This is what they do. So if we think about their connectivity to the workforce, as industry changes, as Dennis pointed out, we've learned a lot. And if industry is changing, the access to talent could be dramatically expanded. Right? right now, if we expect everyone to go to work at a facility, right, you're limited to a geography. Now we can really expand that geography. We may have access to students all over the country who know how to engage in this way. So I think it gives students flexibility now in the workforce and perhaps through you know, virtual mentoring and connectivity with companies. Use this opportunity to expand that experience. And the other thing I want to say to students is that you know, as they think about lifelong learning, now they realize that this is another way to connect and to continue to learn and, and to take courses and engage in lifelong learning experiences. So my hope is that as we think about partnerships, I want our companies to start thinking about now, I'm not, I don't have to have students in a facility that's 20 miles from my workplace. So some of these students that are in remote areas, rural areas, hard to reach places, places where the inequities have are very clear, now we have opportunities to connect with them in ways that we really didn't see as viable just 10 months ago. Oh, that's a great point. Um, you know, I, um, 
I work remotely. Um, I, I, I will continue to work remotely, you know, even post pandemic. Right. And so, um, you know, I'm constantly aware of the fact that, you know, my workforce, um, you know, talent, and then, you know, my coworkers, they can come from anywhere in the country. So, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm hoping that you're right, Vince, and that um, the, the youth that are getting ready to graduate from high school and college and whatnot, see the world kind of more as their oyster, right? So um, those are great, great points. So, um, so Dennis, we're going to um, go back to you for the next, go ahead. Go ahead. You're, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably get this down in about the last I was, was going to say, we, we need a bunch right? of first graders. I know I do. First graders to run the Zoom. Yes. <laughs> and that's actually where I'm going with my comment. I want to actually enhance something, uh, just briefly enhance something that, that Vince said. So Vince, you, you did a wonderful job of explaining how the unexpected need to begin using new technologies by youth, Zooming that whole bit is giving them a set of tools they didn't have before in which they can use to great effect, right? What I want to add to that is, because I come from a different complementary perspective on this, from the employer side, that's an opportunity for us too to connect to them, right? So my, my rhetorical question would be is, so what will we do on the employment and the outreach side to actually take advantage of this new capability, capability that these students have? And it could potentially have an incredible outcome from that if everybody is coming and connecting together in the middle of that next level of connectivity. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Vince. I, 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 Dennis, you said it was rhetorical, but if you don't mind, I want to ask a question. All right. I'd love your perspective on it. I think what I have seen and what I've seen across the country, you know, our employers and, and just being very critical here and, and candid. I, have, I see. I hear a lot of employers complain about the workforce and the work pipeline, but they do nothing proactively to pursue it. Right? They open applications, and if they don't get enough, they complain because they don't have enough. What you have done, Dennis, is you've been proactive. I remember one of our first meetings with you at Toyota. You told us how many fifth graders you thought you needed to fill the pipeline at Toyota, and I just don't know many people doing that. You know, so I, I agree. I think your point of, you know, employers have to be proactive. They have to reach out to students and they have access to a lot more students today than they did 10 months ago. And I think that's your point. Yes. And, but, we, but we need companies to be proactive, be aggressive, make connections with students in deep ways and connect them to opportunities. And that's the way we're going to dramatically expand the, the workforce. So this is a great segue to, to the next question. Um, and, and actually, Kenny, I'm going to start with you on this next question. So one of the, um, the main reasons for most of our audience members joining us is, quite frankly, to get ideas for how they can create plans, programs, policies, and whatnot um, that are relevant to their programs. So I think I mentioned at the beginning of the call, but I'll, I'll just restate it. We have folks from workforce boards, from education institutions, um, from economic development agencies, and so on, um, who are part of our audience. And so when you look at really talking to them about the plans and programs that they can put in place to be proactive, right, um, to do that outreach, I know that you've already talked a little bit about some of the relationships and partnerships that you have. Um, how are you making that successful, Kenny? How are you making those relationships and partnerships? And then what are you finding on the employer side communities can do to set up um, support networks to make sure that that effort continues? Sure. Um, and I come from a completely, I think, different spectrum than, than Vince and Dennis do on this. Um, Which is why you're here. <laughs> wonderful. Um, and I will say when it comes down to the practical application of some of these policies and procedures and ideas that come from the state and workforce boards and communities, the one thing that I would always suggest when I'm talking to um, people at Workforce Development or, or Work One or Work Indiana, whoever I'm talking to, is on a practical level, it has to be workable. It has to be something that when I'm sitting here with 20 kids that I'm working with trying to find placements for jobs when they leave, um, that I can say, what are the needs? What can I do? And it's something that I can actually get done. 
um, so many times in uh, the workforce world, there's there's a conversation and half of this half of the words that people are saying are acronyms for some program that's just been developed or it's getting phased out or it's getting changed or unfunded. Uh, when it comes down to people on the street trying to get it done, it has to be workable. And some of that comes in 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 two ways. One, there has to be a good line of communication from the top down um, on what's available and how to access it. And I think there also needs to be um, a real relationship, not just with business leaders or people in the community who are, you know, driving a workforce board somewhere, but with the actual people who are going to be on in that workforce. Um, I, I, I talk to a lot of people and I hear a lot of people with a lot of ideas of, well, they need this, they need this, and they need this, but they've never talked to they. They've never sat down with the the youth. Um, and in my case, these youth are ones that Unlike what Dennis and Vince were just talking about, they're not the ones that have internet access at home. They're not the ones with the cell phones. These are the ones that are going to get left behind very quickly in this new post-pandemic world that we're all hoping gets here at some point. Um, so there has to be a real relationship between the community leaders and the demographic that we're talking about, in this case, the youth. Um, there has to be a comprehensive approach. It can't be driven from one segment. I mean, there's there's education involved. There's, you know, the state with workforce development involved. There's community leaders involved. There's uh, people like me who are running small, you know, in the whole realm of kind of who we're talking with today, kind of insignificant programs involved. But we all have to have a, a voice at the table to make sure that nobody's getting left behind. Um, and I think it comes down to relationships and it has to be that the relationships continue to be maintained from the top down. And there needs to be a good line of communication. Excellent points. Excellent. So, okay. Well, um, so kind of same question, but to Kenny's point, you know, Dennis and Vince, you guys operate in very, very different worlds. So kind of keeping the audience that we um, just mentioned in mind, what are your um, maybe top points for what those um, community leaders, education institutions, and so on um, can really do to be proactive. I'll let either one of you go. Who wants to go first? Vince? Go ahead, Dennis. Okay, I think uh, three things for me, okay? One, as we come out of this, is uh, at a policy or a program or a development level, I think a refocus on what programs actually work well, what programs make a difference, you know, what programs reach and do what we're trying to do, as opposed to those programs that are less effective in doing that. So I think that is one thing for us to look at on a wider basis. So if we have something that's working, we have something that's doing it, how can we, how can we widen that scope and how can we support that more second thing i would look at is uh i'm gonna say collaborative efforts here i may not get this exactly right but i think i see collaborative efforts in probably two directions that would help here but here's here's one way i'm thinking of it uh, let's say we come up with a great program right it's it's just this most awesome program in the world and everybody's engaged with it and we've got all the partnerships and we know it's going to work cool if we can't get students to that program, if we can't get them through that program, we still fail, right? And there's a lot of reasons students can't do that, especially in our challenge situations. If they can't get there, if they can't get transportation to get there, if uh, there's a number of these, without me going long on this, but I think you see where I'm going with this. So let's make a great program, but then let's look at who we want to get through it and what else, what other support do they need to make that successful for them? So it's not just one program, it's this program, this other program which does this, this agency which helps this, and we have to come together in a common dialogue to put every piece of that puzzle together so that we can we can make it to, to the end uh, with that. The, uh, uh, 
and it just flew out of my head. You asked the question. I had three things. I had one third area to, to, uh, it's okay. I, I actually, yeah. I actually want you to uh, elaborate just a little bit more on the last point that you made. So you talked about, um, being deliberate about those that, that we want to go after, right? Well, how do yes. education institutions or even employers or even workforce boards, how do they make that determination as to who they want to go after? I mean, is it is it by demographic? Is it by skill set? Like, how, where do you start? Uh, let, me, let me clarify that just a little. Do you mean in the case of students or the students yes. we want to get? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I may not have the comprehensive answer to that. I can certainly tell you how we approached it from our program standpoint. Yeah. And some of these aspects, Kenneth, I don't know if they'll all get there. I think touch on some things you said, right, with that. But first thing that we did is we kind of completely took off, you know, took off uh, in one sense demographic issues. We, our most important thing we look at is can we find a capable, motivated student? We don't care what are, we don't care if they are well off, if they're very poor on that. We want you, right? Secondly, we work very close to the ground level. And so while my one point to, to, to Vince, I, which I think is a strong point, how can we all maximize the effect of this new capability that we have, right? But in the end, the fame model has always been to get face-to-face -face at the ground level. And so it's a community-centered model, right? It's a community-centered model. It connects the practitioners of fame to and face to face, not as a on a paper thing, it connects the practitioners of fame to the schools and the kids in the classroom face to face with that. When we do that, that connects the kids to us, that connects us to the kids, that connects us with the teachers who are the collaborators. They are the ones who can then reach out to the kids every day to help bring them along, right? And so, in that sense, I, I think where you're going is, is we don't have a definition that we really want this one or we really want that one in the sense of looking at socioeconomic, anything like that. And then the last thing I'll note is, is as those kids come forward due to whatever reason that they do, we work to actually, which I mentioned a minute ago, right? We work to get the systems together that get them to the end. Is if, so I hope that was where you were going with that. It is. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. So thank you for that. And, and one of the things I, I just want to say before we kick things over to Vince, um, you know, I know that there was a, an excellent um, Brookings paper that was written about your program and some of the successes that it includes. And it does talk a little bit more about the, um, the way that you all go after students and things like that and, and how they're chosen. And so um, I, I will be sure to include that in some of our wrap up notes, but thank you for clarifying that, Dennis. I appreciate that. So Vince, um, I'm going to kick that question over to you. How can communities and community leaders um, be proactive to get some of these um, programs off the ground? Yeah, thank you. A couple, before I answer that question, Kenny, you said something a moment ago, I just wanted to briefly touch on you said compared to the work that Dennis and Vince is doing, I'm doing something insignificant. I, I'm very familiar with what you do, and there's absolutely nothing insignificant about that at all. Okay? You're doing amazing work for a lot of kids, so we appreciate what you're doing. And I think there's a different, there's relative scale, sure. right? And in the work we do. And, you know, I think one of the things I often hear from employers when I mention Toyota. The first thing they say is, yes, but that's Toyota. And, you know, there was a time in Toyota's history going back um, several years ago where they were on the brink of bankruptcy and and quality was not part of what they really talked about. And it was that transition that where a focus on quality and talent um, allowed them to become one of the top companies in the world and one of the most studied companies in the world. But it wasn't always like that. And I, I think um, we also talk about companies like Atlas Holdings and, you know, a private equity firm with manufacturing facilities all over the country and small rural communities that are doing the, the same thing. I would really ask all of us to, to think deeply on a couple of levels. One, are we really actively recruiting students at a time in which we should recruit them? I May mean, I look at sports, for instance, and, you know, 
And as a former high school principal, a school superintendent, I would go to sporting events where you had top athletes and you look in the bleachers and you had 50 coaches from colleges sitting there recruiting our eighth and ninth graders. I mean, they're recruiting talent. I would say we don't do that in the workforce. All these students are there. And we have a lot of information about these students, a lot of ways to connect to them, but I don't know that very many, I don't believe that very many proactively do that. And instead, they sit back in a very reactive way, post jobs, and then hope that someone applies for them and they get the right applicant for the job. And I just think there's an opportunity. If, if a football coach did that, just had you know, tryouts and say, come join the team at, at a university level, I mean, the coach wouldn't last very long. But some way we get a pass by not being proactive and not recruiting students. The other point I'll make that I think is really important is to not necessarily look at this work at a, at a business level, but as a community level, industry level. You know, the work of fame, for instance, isn't, you know, while that work started at Toyota, it's scaling now across manufacturing and across the entire country in North America. And if communities, I believe, need to come together and not look at how they're competing for a zero-sum talent, but if they can create new opportunities in their community, they start to expand that pool. And everyone wins when they do that. So even if resources are limited in a small business, coming together to figure out how you can attract the students in your schools that are in your community, I think it'd be very powerful. And, and so collaboration, regardless of competition, I, I think you have to get away from that. You know, think about it from a community perspective or a regional perspective, not just as your own business and how you have to beat the next business. You're going to do that with the products and service you provide. But when it comes to talent, you have to figure out how to increase that talent pool across the entire community and, and build a skilled workforce. Otherwise, you know, one of the questions we're going to talk about later is just, you know, people talk about the drain brain and, and people relocating. That is absolutely true. I mean, we see it all over the country. But I don't believe it's just because of an aspiration. I think it's a lack of interest and a lack of knowledge and understanding of what can happen in their own communities. A lot of people just don't know. And one other thing that I believe is, is critical in all of this, we have to have a reset of expectations for our students. And that, you know, students have been led to believe a couple of things in our education system. One is you learn math and science so you can take a test and you have to do well on the test. The other is we've um, made them believe that um, that the only measure of success is going to a four-year college and pursuing a bachelor's degree. And I think both of those things are wrong. You know, the first being that we need students to understand what they're learning in our schools today really matter, and they matter for their careers. And the best way we can help them understand that is give them real-world experience and let them see what business and industry does. Go inside a Toyota manufacturing facility, and you'll see all this applied math and science. Okay? You'll see all the things you're learning. And it's not just a Toyota. It's really in every industry. Get students in your businesses. Let them see what you do. And how what you're, what you're doing is making a difference for a lot of other people in that supply chain or if you're the final product that's going to market, would it, wherever it exists, students need to better understand that. And, and then if we can help students understand where there are great career opportunities that may not require them to go to, a, to get a bachelor's degree. I mean, most don't finish anyway, right? It's they get there, they don't finish. So they can get on a real career path with great earnings. And I'd also suggest for business, then we have to give them career trajectory. They have to have upper mobility, opportunity for advancement. It can't just be a great job and that's the end job, right? Um, so, and then continue to help them learn and grow. And, you know, if they need other credentials, help them get those so they can continue to contribute to your workforce.
So we have got a couple of other questions that I know I want to touch on briefly. Before we do, we did have one question come in from the audience that I just want to um, read to you all briefly. And I'll let those of you who want to um, engage with the question do so. And then other, otherwise, we will move on to the next question. Um, so with those that are performing well, and, and this is referring to um, students, um, it could be from a lack of expertise or resources. How do we give, I'm sorry, so she's actually referring to um, workforce boards and employers that are doing well. With those that are performing well, it could be from lack of experience or expertise or resources. How do we give programs with potential what they need to succeed, especially those with close proximity to youth or whatever population area is the focus? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? So basically, I think this goes back to your um, earlier comment, Dennis. Um, I think it was you that had made the comment about um, weeding out those programs that are irrelevant now and, and maybe, um, you know, that we shouldn't be funding any longer. You're, you're on mute. <laughs> you're on mute, Dennis. <laughs> also, too, I'm apparently experiencing some bandwidth issues here, which is not you. Oh, you're fine. I hope yeah. this blasts through. First, first, Andrew, I'm not sure I, uh, I listened both times you hit it. I'm not sure I actually understood. I think based on the first part of what the questioner said entirely. Uh, so I, I, I think it's just that, you know, earlier you had talked about getting rid of programs that are not working yes. and um, I, I guess maybe giving some additional support to those that are. So what would your uh, recommendation be for, let's say, for workforce boards um, or, you know, even education institutions? I think we get set yeah. in our own ways, right? And so we just kind of fund what's there and the budget continues every single year. Um, but how do you actually put enough resources behind programs that are working to be successful? So I think, so, so again, very high level answer, but first I think you have to actually identify those programs one way or the other, right? One way or the other, you know, and how do those programs work? From that point, and let me maybe go one step further and say this. Uh, if a program is working, it's great for those for whom it is working, right? So the question really becomes, how can we expand it to cover more people? And so that then, if, if we're looking specifically at workforce boards and organizations like that, they will have to, one, do I begin looking at programs like this more strongly than I did before? And then two, how do I move my support to that? Those, those boards and organizations are often covered up in a significant layer of bureaucraties, right? And guidelines and so forth. So how do we take a look to where we can be more flexible with our funding or more targeted with it and move it to these programs? And again, think locally, right? You're gonna have more motivation to do this, to move faster and do it if you have programs like Kenneth's, right? where I know Kenneth, I know some of the students, or I know the region of that town, or I know the teachers, right? With that, you can more quickly circle that the contributors to that effort, right? And so that's where I would put part of the focus too. I think beyond that, that can begin to filter up to higher levels to efforts that have a broader impact. I, I, I think what Dennis was saying, and I, and I agree with it, I think from we we find ourselves at PLTW on the other end of that, you know, people vetting programs to ask the question, are we getting the impact and, and the outcomes that they're looking for? And are we the right partner for them? And we have to answer that question all the time. And sometimes we say, no, we're not the right partner for you. And, other, and most of the time when it comes to workforce issues, we are. And it's, it's, it's clearly our focus. But I think it, it's being able to vet those programs, one, and also not believing that you have to invent everything. And I, I think about, let's say, uh, a, any kind of, of company, you know, how many, there was a time where, you know, everyone thought they had to be vertically integrated. Now, you know, you, most people don't, right? It's like, we let, let people focus their expertise where the expertise is. You don't have to create everything. It doesn't have, everything doesn't have to be made by you. And most of us don't do that in our own businesses. But when it comes to workforce issues, why would we then think we control of that? Why don't we find partners that can help us go do those things and build certain things for us? And how do we collaborate? I mean, you look at some high profile 
collaborations. And one of the things, and this was in the Harvard Business Review not too long ago, is how, how do fierce competitors collaborate in places where it makes sense to collaborate? Okay? And you can compete in a lot of ways. I've been to Toyota sitting there with Dennis and others when they had officials from General Motors and Ford Motor Company going through the plant, right? saying, here's how we can do this. Because you know the idea is that you can raise all ships Right? You don't have to just focus that attention on yourself. And I think the other piece, I'm going to give you another high profile situation that I think really puts, for me, uh, um, uh, was a strong statement. Warren Buffett. So we're looking at the most, the wealthiest people in the world, right? was convinced that he needed to give away his money before he died. He had planned to give it all away at his death. And it was his friend, Bill Gates, that told him, why would you do that? Why don't you get to see this money work for yourself? So here's what he did. Instead of creating a family foundation, starting giving money away, he donated $31 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And here's what he said. You guys know how to do this really well. And we're aligned on the things that we want to accomplish together. Here's my money. Go do good. And I thought, wow, what a great example for someone who said, I don't have to recreate this. Just find people who are doing the things that matter for you and work together. And everyone's costs go down and the outcomes get better. Absolutely. You know, one of the big things that we focus on at TPMA is the, um, the idea of regionalism and how communities are really more successful, to your point, when they bring together and pool their, their resources, you know, a workforce board collaborating with the workforce board next door, education institution, same situation, um, you know, the outcomes are obviously going to be better. And I do just want to circle back really quickly to, um, to Dennis, one of the comments that you made uh, a week or two ago when we were chatting, uh, and I don't mean to throw you under the bus if you don't want me to share this so you can just deny it uh, later, but you said that you don't waste time on those education institutions that are not interested in, in partnering. Um, you know, your organization has success, um, you know, nationally recognized success, quite frankly. And to your point, uh, I mean, why spend the time and the resources trying to convince somebody that a program is, is good for them? So I think a lot of people could probably learn from that expertise. So just briefly, we've got about 11 more minutes for questions, and then we're going to give you all your opportunity for wrap up. So um, just briefly, I want to, uh, we're going to skip the, the third question. Well, no, so specifically, um, so I want to talk a little bit about a couple of you made a comment about um, brain drain. Um, and, and so that was one of the areas of, of um, concern that I know that we hear often from communities. So I'm just going to read this question because it's a bit of a longer one. Communities across the country struggle with employing youth. The result usually falls between increased crime rates for those working age youth under the age of 24 or the brain drain. Right. So we have, you know, some of the talent who are sticking around, getting in trouble, ending up in jail. They're now out of our workforce or we have the brain drain that we all hear so much about. Are there unique opportunities to address these issues that communities might consider adopting? So, Kenny, I think we'll go ahead and start with you, because I know that you often work directly with employers. So what are your thoughts yeah. there? Um. And I kind of hit on it earlier on, but I think, and, and this is something that the pandemic has really shown us, and we've had actually very good success with a lot of our programs over this last year um, because we've got employers that are now thinking outside the box. But it, it's how do you get that younger demographic, and I'm not just talking those 16, 17, 18-year-olds, but even down to 14, 15-year-olds, and, and Dennis hit on this as well. How do, how do you get them into your business? How do you get them employed? How do you creatively find hours to not just bring them in and kind of show them what you do, but, you know, hey, you're able, you know, under, you know, whatever applicable laws that you can work so many hours, let's find a way to make it work. Maybe you can work on Saturday. Maybe you can work after school. Maybe you can do a, some kind of an internship where you're job shadowing. We've had a lot of success with that. Um, so there needs to be early involvement in industry, but not just industry. And we're talking about, you know, brain drain and people leaving the community, people getting in trouble with the community. Um, a lot of communities have rich histories, rich traditions, 
a lot of things that people just don't understand are there because they're so wrapped up in their own bubble. Get them involved in the community at an early age. Get them involved in organizations, whether they be, you know, social organizations like the Lions or the Rotary or religious organizations, whatever those organizations are. Get the get the younger people involved holistically through your community, not just thinking employment wise, because it will come back to that eventually because they're going to want to stay. They're going to appreciate what they have. They're going to want to find work in that community. Um, There needs to be opportunities for advancement. And I mean, this was also brought up earlier that, you know, you may give somebody right out of high school a, a really decent job for an 18 year old, but there has to be opportunity for that to grow. It can't maintain at a $14 $14 an hour job for the next 10 years. There has to be advancement. There has to be um, pathways to, to either move vertically or horizontally, but there has to be some type of growth. Uh, people just don't sit in the same job for 30 years anymore. There was a time when that happened. It's just kids today aren't going to do that. Uh, and there needs to be some, some extra auxiliary benefits in the community. And this is where I think the, the, partnership with businesses in the community has to come together. Um, There has to be other things. And we saw this with um, Amazon looking at Indianapolis for for one of their their second headquarters. You know, they were looking at what are the recreational things? How is the public transportation? What kind of sports? What kind of food? What kind of cultural events take place? Communities have to partner with business to increase those. If you're... I'm in a working in a town of 10,000 people in the middle of nowhere, Indiana. But I can tell you what, we have grabbed on to the cultural history that we have and we are making it grow. People want to come here and experience what we have now. That wasn't the case 20 years ago when I left here and moved down near Indianapolis. It, it wasn't. It's here now. And those type of things employers can benefit from by partnering with the community to grab those kids that are already here that already have all of this talent and keep them and it, but it's a it's a holistic approach it's a partnership the, the best things that we've had happen over this last summer have not been through big state programs or federally funded programs they've come through the relationships we've built with local employers local community groups our local vocational training center that has been over backwards to help us start a welding program, uh, a regional healthcare provider that's providing CNA opportunities for our youth with no cost to us. Uh, and, and those didn't come from big program things. Those came from those relationships within the community. And I, I think that uh, looking holistically at that will, will be a, a huge increase going forward. Well, and I, I think the work that you all do is not only inspirational, um, you know, kind of as Vince was talking about earlier with the population that you serve, but just the size of your community um, or and, and the size of your staff and things like that. You all do some amazing outside of the box things. So thanks for sharing that, Kenny. Um, so Dennis, I know Kenny touched on some things that are probably pretty near and dear to your heart, um, especially when we talk about career pathways and even potentially sharing uh, a workforce. But um, I'm going to just kind of briefly repeat this question, then you can pick up on what Kenny said, or if you want to address something differently, feel free. Um, So communities across the country struggle with employing youth. The result usually falls between increased crime rates for those working age youth under the age of 24, or the brain drain that we hear so much about. Are there unique opportunities to address these issues that communities might consider adopting? And you're on mute. (laughs) Go ahead. I guess I have minutes, right? We'll get it down with yes. that. So maybe no surprise again, come back to fame, right? But I'm going to maybe a little bit different angle this time in relation to the, to the question. So as we were developing the vision for fame and what fame would be and how it would work at the practical level, we actually tried to think about these issues, right? Now, we thought them about them from a uniquely business-oriented standpoint. Here's a quick example on us, uh, we would like somebody to, eh, Kenneth is exactly right. You know, studies show that, you know, today people are staying with their employers not as long as they did. Doesn't mean we still don't want them to, right? 
So what can we do? What can we do to keep someone with us longer? That has a, a business outcome to us, right? So with that as a background, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, Andrea, with that. I think I think one of the answers to this, it's both simple and it's complex. Here's a simple thing. Most people want to stay where they grew up. Now, we don't always think that in that 16, 17, 18. Oh my, this is the worst place in the world. Can't wait to get out of here, right? One of the jokes I tell people is I spent 20 some years trying to figure out how to get out of Kentucky and seven more trying to figure out how to get back in, right? What will keep somebody locally if you have communities and if you have a good job? Give them community connections, give them a good job. There's the magic pill, easy to say. Now, here's how we approach and fame, right? We've got to make sure we have good jobs. To have good jobs, we have to have well-educated people who can do good work and make that company competitive and make that company grow, right? In order to have talented and good workers, we've got to improve the educational product, and we have to effectively draw people locally from that, right? So I would say this in the, in the big picture, again, coming from fame. It's built on a local model. The heartbeat, as big as this program is, the heartbeat beats in a community. Local schools, local students, local employers, and local supporters all working together in one circle to make it happen. We connect. Our primary focus is the 18-year-old student. We do have others come in, but there comes your thing. We're picking them up at 18, and if we can engage them, educate them, and employ them, you're probably not going to have a lot of the crime and so forth in that 18 to 24 year old window, right? With that, we have built additions to fame beyond that two year program, beyond that connected employer. Our placement rate at graduation is 85% with the sponsoring employer immediately after they graduate. Great for the student, great for the employer, right? But what about do you have future opportunities? Can you go further? So I won't go into all the details of fame, but in light of that, guess what we did? We built, we built in seamless, connected, educational uh, additions that take you further if you want to go. Right now, we have two very soon to announce the third bachelor's degree, seamlessly connected to the associate degree at the two-year level. We have two master's degrees with that. So who wants to go further? Who is, who is uh, energized to do that? We've got it built in for you and at more advantage than you just finding a school on your own. We graduate kids out of the two-year program with no debt, right? And so if the message is not, hey, guys, think about fame and, and take it. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think we're doing some things in fame that directly address what you're talking about. Those kids are going to get a better education here. They're going to get a job here. They're going to stay here. We don't have the brain. And we have people who connected to the community and motivated to improve the community. Excellent points. And with my economic developer hat on, I'm always like, you know, trying, trying to get people to stay, um, you know, where they grew up. That's definitely a challenge that even the, the economic development folks face. So, um, so Vince, same question to you. No. Um, go ahead. No, see, yes, I, you know, it's really um, the points that, Kenny and Dennis have made, I think, were outstanding, and Kenny did a wonderful job of thinking about this as a community and how we approach this. And you know, just to highlight two points, I you think about what do people pursue? So if you start to backward map or start to think about root cause of any any particular problem we're trying to face, when students are going through K twelve education. You know, they're often talking about careers and they're going to pursue economic prosperity and they're going to pursue a quality of life. And as a community, if we can't offer either one of those, they're going to go somewhere else. And if we're not proactive in helping them understand and engaging them in a community in an early age, they're going to pursue it somewhere else. What's interesting is we have them in our yard. We have them right there in our community. And everything else they generally read about and they go pursue something that's really unknown. We can provide a real substance for them where they where they live. I spoke to a Rotary Club yesterday in Michigan, virtually, but you know, they had a group of students participating in their Rotary Club. And I think, you know, Kenny mentioned that indirectly. I think it was just great. They're saying we want to we want to we're connecting with our youth and our community and showing them how to be a part of that. 
So I, I think all that's, that's been said, I think, is very, very good. And so how do you invest in your community? How do you cre- increase the quality, the quality of life, a cultural opportunity for students and career pathways and career tra- trajectory, I think, are really important. I want to highlight a couple other points that I heard in this conversation. I, you know, we talk about employees wanting to stay with their employers and, you know, and we want them to stay longer. I will argue that that is not a student problem, that's an employer problem. And, you know, I don't think it, people talk about millennials and next generations and how they uh, have different expectations. I would say what really drove that, in my opinion, was the way industry treated employees. I mean, you have companies with quarterly returns and layoffs and, you know, we started to treat employees more like a variable cost than we have an asset. And if we're going to treat employees that way, why would we expect that they treat us better? Okay? And we have to invest in them. And we can't say to them, just come here, do the job, and we're going to get the value from you. But the value, the only value we're going to return to you is a, an hourly wage. Well, then don't expect them to be loyal. Don't expect them to stick around very long because they're just going to pursue the higher wage at the next employer. Okay? So we need to invest in them, invest in their well-being, invest in their families, invest in their education, their continued learning. And we do that, we can build a kind of culture within a company that people want to stay. And so all I think those things are very, very important. Last point that you know I, I think about just various dynamics have happened. You look at the current student loan debt and you know, Dennis talked about fame and how they're really focused on being able to finish an associate's degree with no debt. Well, the reality is we have created that same uh, situation for our students because we said everyone needs to go get a bachelor's degree. And there were so many dead ends for many students. And not just for those who didn't complete and racked up a lot of debt. For those who did complete and are pursuing majors in which there's no demand for it, right? Yeah, you know, we for have no salary. Yeah, absolutely. We have college universities selling stuff that there's no value in it, right? And I won't go into my higher education um, uh, diatribe, but I think it is important that students understand that if you're going to pursue this education, there's a direct, direct demand for it in the market. And this is the right kind of investment for you. You spend your money wisely. Debt's not bad if you're using it to advance yourself. But if you're just using it unwisely, and you'll never be able to repay those debts. We can do better for our kids. No, absolutely. These are, these are great points. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Um, so, okay. So we are just a little bit over time. So, um, but that's okay, because we're wrapping up right now. So, um, I, I have seen a couple of questions come in um, and I see um, Kenny left a note too. We're going to take some of these notes and I'll, I'll put them in a wrap up as well. And if, for our panelists, if there's anything else that you all want to add, we can certainly include that in a wrap up as well. Um, so moving forward then, um, I think we'll go ahead and give Dennis the floor. If you want to um, give us just a quick kind of wrap up on your final thoughts, if there's anything that we didn't address from apprenticeships to all of the myriad of issues that we could be discussing with youth um, unemployment and employment. Um, what are your thoughts? I think my, my thoughts would be this, is uh, I think that if we want to be more successful, I'm talking about we as a society, the name of the game is change. So there are many things that we continue to do and they don't work, but we continue to do it, right? How do we, I won't hit the details of this, but for example, how do we effectively reach out to communities of color and to females to bring them into STEM careers and specifically into technical careers in a much greater proportion than they are now? Well, whatever it is we're doing, it's not working, right? So whatever the angle you're looking at this problem toward, you know, challenged youth and so forth with that, if what you're doing and what you're thinking is really what you've still been doing, <laughs> you've been doing before, it's and unless it's giving you a return, you probably need to think about changing that, right? 
And then that change needs to go across the board. Employers need to check. By the way, Vince, I agree 100% the issue of if, you know, we're not keeping people in jobs longer than they have, and they're moving, it's an employer problem. I agree 100%, right? So what do we as employers need to do to improve that? What do schools need to do to better align what they are doing to the workplace community that's out there? What do we need to do to better direct youth to the jobs of the future? Uh, STEM jobs, right? I'm, of course, I'm an advocate of STEM, and that's how fame came about. But if we have increasing technology, if we need more technical workers with greater capability, and that's where the jobs openings are going to be, and they pay more, what are we doing for the, for the students? What are we doing for the employers? What are we doing for the communities to move students in that direction? Not a whole lot from what I've seen, or at least not a whole lot effectively, right? So the big picture is, is, is it's time for us to change, folks. If you're an employer out there, if you're an economic developer out there, if you're in the education system, it ought to be easy enough for you to figure out. It is for me, from my standpoint, right? What, what is Dennis doing that's not working? Well, I need to change. And so do all of us. And we need to refocus it into where we want to go and the most effective way to get there and bringing the players and the organizations collaboratively together to do it. That's it. Well, and if, if there is a, a change agent, if we have ever seen one, it is a global pandemic, right? So, um, you know, I think if that gives some some folks some uh, motivation for change, this should definitely be it. So um, anyway, so moving on. So, um, Kenny, do you, uh, do you have any closing thoughts that you want to share? Yeah. Um... Like I mentioned earlier, through all of the struggles and all the hardships and all the awful things that happened that was known as 2020, we really saw a huge increase in what we did. We saw a huge success in our programs. We saw a lot of things that we didn't really think that could happen happened um, because people were forced for not a great reason, but they were still forced nonetheless to think outside the box. Um, and with the, the population I work with, um, it did bring up some very glaring things that um, have changed over the years, things that were uh, left out or discarded as the years went on that maybe need to be readdressed. Um, educationally, I have a lot of kids that come in, you know, and we've got a welding program and you know, I'm going to age myself a little bit. And I think that Vince and Dennis maybe had this experience. But uh, when I went through high school, every everybody had a shop class. We learned, you know, basic just skills, you know, how to use a wrench, how to do these basic things. Youth these days don't have that. They they don't have that opportunity. My the high school that I went to, their basic all their shop classes are, are closed. They don't even offer them anymore. Um, so there's there's I think it's shown a, a, de a deficit in some of our education and some things that maybe we need to go back to um, legislation wise. Um, we have a lot of programs. Indiana has a lot of programs available. Um, they're not always very accessible. We've had some great conversations with people at workforce development, um, with work one, with with all of the entities involved. And they all agree. Yes, it's hard to get to the dollars. It's hard to access some of these things. Um, communities, I give great examples of, of how our local community has really uh, stepped up and, and provided opportunities for us to be able to work with youth, even youth that aren't even going to stay in our community. We're, we've got community leaders that are willing to work with youth, knowing full well they're leaving and going back to all areas of Indiana. They're not staying in Wabash for the most part. Um, but they just have a a desire to to be proactive to know that some of those youth will stay we will get a percentage of those that will stay in the community and we want to to really foster that so i i'm very hopeful going into 2021 that the lessons that we've learned through 2020 are going to have some real impact in how i'm able to work with the youth that i have firsthand in my my classroom every day and that we're going to see huge successes 
um, with our programming going forth and being able to get youth employed and in meaningful careers. Excellent. You know, I, I think for those members of the, the community who are lucky enough to have community leaders like you all in their community, I, I think that there really is a, a true opportunity for, for each of those communities to, um, you know, come out of this whole thing better than, than we went in, right? I, I do genu genuinely think that. So thank you for all the hard work that you do in your community, Kenny. So, Ben. Oh, I muted myself. Sorry. How, okay. how about any uh, closing thoughts you might have? Yeah, very briefly, I I really appreciate the, the things that have been shared. I think all of us have a, a tremendous sense of optimism um, aligned with uh, a sense of realism. You know, what's possible, what can be done. I thought I would leave us with just a, an example of how others have viewed us and the things that are really important. Julia Gillard, who was a former prime minister of Australia, um, delivered a speech in, to the a joint session of Congress a few years ago, and it just always stuck with me. And you know, to think about this point of optimism as a country, but I'm just going to read, a, if you don't mind, just a couple passages from it. It said, "Our future growth relies on competitiveness and innovation, skills and productivity, and these in turn rely on the education of our people." So, if the eyes of the world are still upon you. Your city on a hill cannot be hidden. Your brave and free people have made you the masters of recovery and reinvention. As I stand on this cradle of democracy, I see a nation that has changed the world and known remarkable days. I firmly believe you're the same people who amazed me when I was a small girl by landing on the moon. On that great day, I believed Americans could do anything. I believe that still. And I, I go back and read that occasionally because we can do anything. Okay? If we come together as a people and as a communities and regions and states, I'm convinced we can get this done. And it's not a people shortage. We don't have a shortage of people. We have more people in the workforce today than at any time in history. We have more students in our schools at any time in history. Okay? So they're there. We just have to connect with them and give them the opportunities and experiences to pursue these pathways. And then we'll continue to prosper as a, as a nation. So thank you for the opportunity to be part of this. So thanks, Andrea. Thank you, Vince. I'm almost um, nervous to say anything after that, um, after that last quote in closing. Um, it's definitely, um, it, it not only does it hit home with you all and the work that you're doing with youth, um, but it really does hit home because the, the panel right before you all, um, there was definitely a lot of similarities. And, and if anything, I can say from a takeaway, um, they, they were kind of jokingly talking about Team USA and about how, you know, our, our collective efforts to um, put the most vulnerable populations kind of in, in front, right, in front of the recovery and, and to make sure that they come out of this um, better than, than how they were uh, originally prior to, um, I guess, March of 2020. Um, that we will all collectively be better. So um, Vince, your quote was uh, was spot on. So thank you. And I'm sure that that will find its way into our wrap up <laughs> comments. So thank you so much for that. Um, so just in closing, and I, I do want to point out, we are closing right on time. So 345, man, I don't know um, how many times I've ever seen that happen. So um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I know that we'll have some additional questions from uh, folks in the audience and um, just really appreciate your expertise and your insight, especially from your view, um, because I know that the three of you have very different um, worldviews right now and the audiences that you share and, and participate in with. So, so thank you so much. And um, we will follow up again via email with some wrap up notes and just really appreciate your time today. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank Take you. care, all. Be safe. Bye-bye.